Oh, there we are, yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about um, Calico's EVPF data plane, and I have a couple of slides at the end um, uh, about the friends. Um, so we have more than one, more than one uh, data plane, um, and some of them maybe uh, maybe you haven't heard of before. So um, I thought I'd just drop a couple of slides in at the end to to tell you about the uh, the other data planes that Calico has and and why you you may or may not want to use those. Um, this is the agenda for the talk. So mostly I'm going to talk about the, the eBPF data plane. Um, that's that's what I've been working on for the last uh, year or so. Um, and yeah, just going to take you through what it's all about, why we did this, um, how fast it is. Uh, everyone, everyone's uh, always interested in that. Um, and then yeah, just a couple of slides at the end about, about the others. So uh, without further ado, I'll dive in. Um, so yeah, um, <clears throat> my I'm looking. There we go. So, uh, what what's Calico's EBPF data plane? Uh, it's an alternative data plane for Calico. So, Calico is is the um, uh, kind of most widely uh, used uh, networking and security uh, solution for Kubernetes. Um, you know, we've got hundreds of thousands of clusters out there using Calico. Um, a few parts to Calico. So we have our data model, um, you know, that's stored in up in Kubernetes API server. We've got our calculation logic that takes all the policy and distills it for, for every host. And then we have the actual implementation, like how do we get packets around through the Calico network? How do we secure them? How do we drop the bad ones, allow the, the right ones through? And that's the data plane. Um, so we've had pluggable data planes in Calico for a while. Um, so I was going to talk about a couple of those later on, a couple of the other ones later on. Um, but uh, eBPF is the one that that we've recently added, uh, and so that's what it is. Um, seems obvious we use eBPF instead of um, the standard Linux um, uh, networking technologies that that the uh, kind of standard Calico data plane is based on. Um, that's mainly IP tables and Linux routing and, and those kind of things. Um, instead of that, we're using eBPF. I've got a slide next that, that explains eBPF if you're, if you're not super familiar with it. Um, so the, like, why eBPF? Well, we can, we can do things with eBPF that we can't do um, in, in the old world, in the, in the standard Linux data plane. Um, so we've got some eBPF only features, which I'm going to cover in more detail. Um, and uh, you know we can we can give you great performance. So I'm going to cover cover the the sorts of trade offs that we make there and and what we um, what we can do there later on. Um, so yeah, uh, whizzy new features that we can't do in the old data plane. Great performance, um, and. Just as a word of warning, um, little caveat, uh, it has some new features that we don't have in the IP tables um, world, but it also lacks a few features that we do have in the IP tables world. Um, you know, some of those are due to like fundamental differences between the two. So, you know, um, I have a list of them later, but the, the IP tables log action is not available from EVPF because it's, it's an IP table specific feature. So we can't, we can't use that. Um, but yeah, so eBPF, um, what's it all about? Um, I mean, you've probably heard of eBPF already, um, but um, just just to recap, um, so it's it's a virtual machine that runs inside the Linux kernel. Um, it's a bit like the Java virtual machine, so it runs its own type of bytecode, um, uh, and the the name. Um, means extended Berkeley packet filter, but it's not only used for packet filtering these days. So the, the name's a bit of anachronism, an anachronism, um, but it just so happens that Calico is using it for packet filtering. So it can be a little bit confusing when you hear, um, uh, hear of other uses like monitoring and that kind of thing. Um, uh, a key thing to know about EPPF is uh, the, the mini programs that we can put in the kernel um, that, that run on this virtual machine, 
are event driven. So they're triggered by something happening uh, in the kernel. It, it's not like a sort of user process where it just runs and runs and, and can, you know, do things and set timers and trigger and, um, you know, display an animation or something. Um, it has to be triggered by something happening. Um, so some examples um, could be a packet arriving. I mean, that's a key one, key one for Calico. Um, so packet arrives, eBPF program runs, um, maybe it drops the packet. That's one of the things that that particular eBPF hook can do. Um, maybe it allows the packet through. Um, maybe it decides to um, turn the packet around, swap its headers, respond with an ICMP message. There's a couple of places where we do that in the in the Calico eBPF data plane. Um, so it has some flexibility in what it can do. Um, you know, it can mangle the packet in in any arbitrary way. Basically, um, it can drop it. It can allow it through for normal processing. Um, but what it can do is constrained to the packet and the particular hook that it's attached to. Um, similarly, you know, packet being sent, maybe that one could drop it, allow it, or encapsulate it and send it down a tunnel or, or something like that. Um, there are thousands more hooks in the kernel. Um, so uh, various subsystems use eBPF now. Um, the, there's a there's a hook for you know every syscall that a program makes, and people are using that to police syscalls and uh, generate um, like audit logs of what every program does, and maybe block um, people from accessing certain files, that that kind of thing. Um, there there are ones for um, deciding which socket a, a packet goes to when it arrives at the host, uh, choosing the source IP when when um, uh, a packet is leaving the host, and all kinds of things um, across all the different subsystems. Um, since running code in the kernel uh, would be dangerous, I mean, you know, if you load a, a kernel module or something like that running in kernel space, um, that's dangerous. It, it can do anything. Um, uh, the um, BPF programs that we load are all subjected to a verification process. So the, the kernel has a very rigid um, uh, like verifier. It ensures that um, your BPF program cannot access memory and that it's not allowed to. Um, it cannot run forever. So it's not allowed to tight loop or um, uh, run more than a certain number of instructions. That's how, how they ensure that. Um, and it's... Um, just generally quite locked down, like the functions in, that it can call within the kernel, those are all very limited to a specific, um, you know, allow list of, of functions that we're allowed to call. So it's it's fairly safe, although of course, if we're, if we're dropping packets and we drop essential packets, then obviously that could, that could cause problems. Um, so why choose EPPF? Um, Going to contrast it with the um, IP tables data plane and and sort of explain why why it's different. Um, so the IP tables data plane is baked into the kernel um, in, as the the net filter um, subsystem. It does get a lot of active development, um, but because it's in the kernel and it's it's C code that's part of the kernel, uh, its development cycle is quite slow. Um, so if they're adding a new feature there, they have to worry about back compatibility with absolutely everything that's out there. And the feature may go in today, but that kernel will not be available in, you know, Ubuntu say until, you know, two, three, four years down the line when that particular kernel gets, gets rolled out. Um, so, I mean, the great thing about that is it's generally very stable and, and, and battle hardened. IP tables have been around for years. Even NF tables, kind of the, the version two of IP tables, has has been around for years at this point. Um, so stable but slow moving, slow development process. Um, it's very general, um, so it can handle all the things that the um, the Linux kernel is capable of handling. So uh, tunneling packets, IPsec. Um, uh, bridging, routing, all that sort of stuff is all integrated in it. 
And that's what this diagram on the right hand side is. Uh, it's a diagram of the, the net filter and all the networking stack. Um, but there's only one path through that for any particular packet. Um, it comes in on the left hand side and it goes through these stages one by one. Um, and some of them make choices and send it, um, send it up into a different layer or some of them loop it round. But you're very constrained um, in that world. Um, you, you can't do anything that's like super creative. You can't um, bypass a big chunk of it if you can spot early on that this packet doesn't need all of that extra processing. Um, and if you want to jump from one place to another to do something interesting, then, then you don't have that capability without patching the kernel, which is a non-starter for, for most products. Um, BPF, on the other hand, um, diagram kind of gives it away. Um, but it's very flexible. So it can do kind of impossible things. Like if you want to attach a BPF program, like somewhere on the left of this, that, um, that suddenly sends the packet out of a particular interface, having added a custom encapsulation header and uh, switch the MAC address and make it go out of your interface. That's the kind of thing that you can do in, in BPF land. Um, and that's that's great if you're trying to to like wring the most performance out of out of uh, a system. Um, and that that's one of the things that I like to I like to think about BPF. It lets you trade this generality and compatibility for for performance. So a lot of the performance that we get in the uh, the BPF data plane is because we do exactly this. What this red line is doing. Uh, we take a packet that's come in on the left-hand side, and when it hits the uh, the Q disk box on the left, uh, you don't don't worry about the I chart. Um, we can pick it up and we can send it directly to a local Kubernetes pod, um, or if we're load balancing at, at ingress for a node port or something in in Kubernetes, we can turn it straight around and send it back out of the the same interface. And we don't have to go through all of these blocks in the diagram um, and pay the price that, that they have. But the, the counterpoint to that is some of the blocks in the diagram um, may be uh, useful. Um, so uh, in your particular scenario, like the boxes in the top right of the diagram where it kind of loops around on itself, uh, those are the boxes that handle IPsec traffic. So if you do this bypass, then you can't do IPsec because you bypass the IPsec subsystem. Um, that's, that's fine for a lot of use cases, um, but uh, it's something you need to be aware of. Like there's, there's no free lunch, like the, the C code in the kernel is pretty fast for what it does. Um, but if you bypass a big chunk of it, you can, you can get some good wins um, and you can do some, some much more flexible, like creative things that, that solve problems um, that you're not able to do in, in the other world. So that's that's kind of my thoughts on it. And I know when when Kim Volk have done some micro benchmarks and, and when I've done the same, like if you do like really like tight micro benchmarks for certain operations in IP tables and BPF, like sometimes the BPF one is slower, sometimes it's faster. They're both kind of pretty well optimized uh, for what they do. Um, but it's really the flexibility and the, the ability to do these like interesting trade-offs that, that you get a lot from. Um, so yeah, good for different users and, and different use cases. I mean, obviously BPF, um, it's a trait of newer kernels. So if you're, if you're on a quite stable older kernel, then um, you can just stick with IP tables with, uh, with Calico, that's no problem. Um, so let's, let's talk a bit more about some of the um, the flexibility that that it brings. Um, so one one of the pain points in um, in Kubernetes networking um, for for a long time is when you're using um, Kube Proxy and you have some external tra traffic. Um, in order for Kube Proxy to do to to take in traffic from a node port and send it on to a, a backing pod, uh, it ends up needing to S snap the traffic. So the traffic arrives at the first host, let's call that the ingress host. Um, and it detects that it's a node port using IP tables rules or IPVS uh, in, if you have that turned on. Um, it, it does a DNAT 
which changes the destination IP of the packet to send it to the backing pod. But it's really critical that the packet, the response packet from the backing pod goes back through the same host that the ingress packet came, uh, came to. Otherwise, that DNAT, DNAT can't be reversed because none of the other hosts know about it. So the packet comes in and it does a DNAT, which is what it really wants to do. And then it has to do an SNAT as well. So change the source IP to be the host's IP. And that means that for all of your web server logs um, and for you know, network policy, you see the source IP as being really not very useful. You see it as the, um, uh, the host IP where the packet arrived rather than the original host IP from outside. So BPF, we can, uh, we can deal with this problem. Um, and kind of break some of the, the rules that, that, um, that are in place in the sort of standard Linux data plane and do something a little bit different. Um, so for, for example, packet comes in um, to, a, to a node port, the BPF program, and um, so this is, this is how Calico works. Um, we replace kube proxy um, with, with code in our BPF programs. Um, we, do, uh, we do the load balancing there. And then um, rather than doing an SNAP, we encapsulate the packet, keeping it exactly as it is inside, but we, we stick a VX9 header on it. We send it to the correct node, like the backing node um, that has the backing pod on it. Um, we have a BPF program there that captures that packet, decapsulates it, does the DNAP so that the packet will, be, will go to the pod and the pod will be expecting packets with that IP address, packet arrives at the pod and it still has the original source IP address, just we, we didn't change it. And the way we've made sure that we're on the reverse path is because we did the DNAT on the target host rather than, or so on the backing host rather than the, the ingress host. So when the pod responds, we have a BPF program there that can catch the response packet and sort of reverse it all the way along the chain. Um, so that, that's the kind of creative thing that you can do in, in BPF land that you, you couldn't really do in, in IP tables land. Um, I believe IPVS does allow this kind of thing, but it's subtly kind of wrong for Kubernetes just because of how, how it assumes that the, uh, the backing pod would receive the traffic. So the encapsulated packet would have to go all the way to the backing pod which means your backing pod has to be rewritten and, and it kind of changes the networking model, I, I, I think, if I, if I understand that correctly. Um, so yeah, that, that's the sort of thing that we can do there. And I guess I should do a demo um, and, and show some of this stuff. So let me see if I can uh, switch my share. And I'll change it to be my one. Hopefully, um, that means that you can all see um, a couple of windows. So on the left, I have the um, Google Cloud microservices demo, which is a great test app for a new data plane um, because uh, it, it runs lots of services. It uses Kubernetes services to, to um, kind of load balance between them all. Um, and each of them is written in a different language. So you get to see all of the different networking quirks of the different languages and all of their different DNS behavior and, and things like that. Um, so hopefully, uh, I started this a while ago, so hopefully it's still running. Um, can page around, I can buy a vintage typewriter and place my order and it will create a, uh, uh, create a, um, an order in its database. Uh, my cluster right now is running uh, with Kube proxy in Calico IP tables mode. So if I do a Kube cut on get pods, hopefully that's all running. There we go. Um, so these are the sort of services running in the default namespace. So all the um, the pods that make up the, um, the microservices demo. Um, we got Calico node running. Uh, it's in IP tables mode. We have kube proxy running. Um, and 
uh, yeah, that's all working. Um, I've got an Nginx running as well. And the reason I've got that running is because I want to show some um, access logs so you can see that the source IP is preserved. So I'll, I'll uh, turn on BPF mode in a minute and then I'll show the access logs as they change. Um, so let's get BPF mode turned on. So before, uh, before we started, um, I did the first step of, a, of turning on uh, BPF mode. So I applied this, uh, this config map. Um, hopefully the, the text is just about visible. But I applied a config map and the config map tells Calico the real um, IP address of the um, Kubernetes API server. Um, so I'm about to disable kube proxy, and that means that Calico takes over from kube proxy. And in order to bootstrap the whole system, we have to know the piece of information that kube proxy normally knows, which is how to really reach the API server, not through the, the sort of um, Kubernetes service IP. So I applied that already and restarted the Calico pods. Um, and then I'll, I'll take a look at that Nginx log. I hope that's on my. My command history. So if I refresh here, hopefully we'll see. Success. Have I got the right node port? Do you have the right node port? Okay, gave it a refresh and now it's working. Um, so the thing to note is um, I'm hitting one of the um, one of the nodes, and the IP address that are, that ends up in the logs is ten one twenty eight one thirty six, which is the IP of one of my nodes that that I'm coming through, and that's not really very useful um, uh, to. Like it's not useful for um, the, the log and it's not useful for policy either. If I wanted to allow this traffic in policy, I'd have to allow my node IP addresses. Not, not great. Um, and yeah, that's, that's still working, great. So I'm now gonna turn on uh, BPF mode. Wait, I'm gonna disable kube proxy first. Um, so what am I doing here? So I'm doing a cube cuttle patch of the cube proxy daemon set. This is all in our in our docs, and I'm adding a node selector to it um, that that makes it only run uh, on nodes that are explicitly tagged with non calico. I haven't tagged any nodes with non calico, so cube proxy just won't run anywhere. Um, it's a nice simple way to disable uh, disable cube proxy um, temp temporarily in this case. So if we do that, um, I think because I set this cluster up on GCP, it sort of has some auth it's doing in the background. There we go. Uh, now everything should still work because I haven't churned anything. So kube proxies rules will still be in IP tables. Um, I'm worried this one's flaky. Uh, kube proxies rules should still be in, in IP tables and everything. Um, and nothing's deleted those yet. But if I apply, if I mark BPF enabled, um, so what I'm doing here is I'm editing the um, Calico uh, Felix configuration to turn on the BPF enabled flag. And that needs to be true, not false. I had it running earlier. So if I turn that on, then uh, Felix configuration is patched. And now, um, everything should still work if I refresh, hopefully. What's uh, earlier? <laughs> Maybe the demo gods are not smiling on me. So, in theory, with the latest Calico, you shouldn't even need to do a hard refresh there. It should carry on working. Um, but I've done a hard refresh and it has come back. 
Um, so maybe I'll investigate that later. Um, but yeah, that's still working. We should be in uh, in BPF mode now. Um, this one is now working as well. And if you notice, the source IP has changed. So uh, like nothing kind of obvious happened in the cluster, um, apart from that little bit of disruption we saw, which i say we shouldn't really have seen. Um, but the, um, the source IP that Nginx is seeing now is the uh, is my source IP, um, so like don't don't try and hack me or anything. Um, but now when I access it, we're seeing the real source IP from all the way outside the cluster. Um, and if I refresh a few times, should just say consistent. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, that's all I have for a demo. Switch my share back to the other screen. Okay. So that's the that's the demo. Um, but if I go to the next slide, um, I can tell you how we sort of build on this even further. So. Um, the next step after this is if your network supports it, we can implement a feature called DSR or direct server return. So this is another option that you can turn on. All starts the same way. So the packet comes in um, to, the, to the node port. We encapsulate it, we send it to the correct backing node, gets decapsulated, but, and the pod sees exactly the same packet as, as it did before. But then when it responds, um, the uh, the BPF program running on the backing node is able to um, just respond. So rather than rather than doing um, encapsulation to get it back to the original node and send it back along this kind of safe path where it's guaranteed to work, um, instead we can just um, like essentially spoof the packet and pretend that we are the first node and send it uh, send it directly back to the um, the client. Um, so, as, as I kind of mentioned, there's a big caveat with this. Um, your network has to allow this exact type of spoofing. Um, so if you're on-prem um, and you're in particular layer two network, this works quite nicely, um, then you can arrange for that to, to work well and you cut off this extra, extra hop. Um, if you're in the cloud, um, it works within the same subnet in AWS and GCP. Um, but it doesn't work with load balancers. So it is, it is a little bit of a limitation there. Um, but just to give you a feel for the kinds of um, things that, that you can do with BPF that you can't do, um, you, you wouldn't be able to tell um, the IP tables, data plane to, you know, well, don't, don't do your normal contract thing where you send the packet back where, the way it came. You need to do this odd thing and, and respond in, in this kind of non-standard way. It's, it's just not possible. Um, so yeah, um, that's flexibility and the sort of interesting features we can do. Uh, now onto performance. Um, so performance wise, um, uh, we, do, um, we do benchmarking on a back-to-back -back pair of servers with a, with a 40 gig uh, link to, to kind of separate the two data planes. Um, this is this is the output from a simple test with just iperf running single threaded, um, and we see about twenty seven gigabits per second, or just single threaded with a with that basic benchmark between the two two servers, um, and that's a that's at the sort of standard um, you know fifteen hundred type MTU. Um, if you bring VXLAN into the picture. Uh, for encapsulation or WireGuard, you get about 10 gigabits per second um, in the same benchmark. So just flip on the WireGuard switch and you have encryption, but you trade, you trade some performance. Um, and if you use our IPIP data, uh, IPIP encapsulation option, um, it drops down to six gigabits per second. And what I think has happened is since we originally developed Calico um, a few years ago, um, like we picked IPIP because it was the fastest at the time. 
um, as our sort of standard, um, uh, like out of the box um, encapsulation. Um, I think the has got a lot of love in the kernel and WireGuard too um, is, is also uh, like highly tuned and they've just overtaken OPIP. Um, so if you if you want to use encapsulation, I recommend uh, VXLAN, um, especially with eBPF mode, because there are some specific incompatibilities with with IPIP that slow it down. They don't they don't break it, but um, but slow it down a bit. Um, slicing that same data a different way, um, like just taking the data from the same test, um, we can measure the CPU per packet instead. Um, and if you look at it that way, um, like we're saving sort of 50% CPU at the smaller MTU size. And if you bump up to a 9K MTU, we still save a little bit, um, but, but overall the, the CPU used to send a 9K packet is mostly shifting the 9K data and then the bits we're doing are, are a small part of it. So you see a much bigger difference at smaller packet sizes. Um, but you, you do see a CPU improvement in, in both cases. Um, and one reason I like to slice it this way as well is um, not everybody cares about 27 gigabits, 40 gigabits of, of traffic, um, but most people would rather have less CPU used. So, um, you know, if, you, if you're moving any like significant amount of traffic, it should reduce the amount of CPU used. Um, one of the things that comes with the Calico eBPF data plane is uh, the cube proxy replacement. And this isn't optional in, in our data plane. Um, so some of the features that, um, that the Calico data plane has like host endpoint protection and, and that kind of stuff um, meant that we really had to take this over and make to make sure everything happened in the right order and in, inside the kernel. Um, so we've taken over from Cube Proxy when you're in BPF mode, um, and and our implementation is faster. Um, so it's faster than IP tables mode all the time. Um, it's faster than IPVS mode, but it's it's a kind of splitting hairs with IPVS, like you know a fraction of a millisecond. Um, IP tables, the performance varies a lot depending on how many services you have. So as the number of services increases, um, IP tables really slows down. So if you're talking like 10,000 services, you really want to be using IPVS or, um, or eBPF um, because the, uh, those both scale kind of order one in the number of, um, in the number of uh, services and yeah, just keep their performance even with really high numbers of services. Um, scale on this graph i mean even with 10,000 services ip tables is still only taking like a millisecond so it sort of depends if if you're counting every millisecond as well um how do we evaluate dsr um so we do a simple uh, round trip test um so we set up an nginx um pod and then just curl use curl with all its um, debug options turned on um so we measure the sort of real like time to first content um time in in that setup um and we saw um ip tables mode um is just above 1.5 milliseconds in our test uh ipvs mode in cube proxy 1.5 milliseconds um uh, bpf with uh, the sort of non-direct so where it goes back to the first node uh beats that a little bit so down at about 1.3 milliseconds and then uh, with DSR, uh, we knock another kind of 0.3 milliseconds off that to take it down to, to one millisecond. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the performance section of the talk. A um, little word on limitations. So we're IPv4 only at the moment. Um, we wanted to get, get the data plane out there, get it into people's hands and um, kind of implement a broad set of the uh, of Calico's features before we tackled uh, things like IPv6. Um, one of the key pieces of advice we had about making an eBPF data plane was you have to cover a broad set of the features you want, otherwise you can kind of micro-optimize it and end up with 
uh, like going down a blind alley where it's uh, it's very fast for the one feature you implemented, but then it ends up slow because you've 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 made some poor choices elsewhere. So we wanted to do a broad broad base um, and and get it out there. Um, we're on x86 64 only at the moment. Um, the main reason for that is just um, doing the cross builds. Our infrastructure wasn't quite set up for it. So we can cross build Go binaries quite easily, but cross building um, all the um, uh, cross building the, uh, the BPF binaries is a little more fiddly. Um, I think AMD 64, uh, sorry, ARM 64 would be fairly straightforward to do. Um, but the other ones um, that that we have some support for, like PowerPC, we might need to flip the endianness and so on and, and work on that. Um, right now, all nodes in the cluster must run the BPF data plane. And that's because the, the kind of creative, like, NCAP based um, uh, external traffic solution that I talked about requires that BPF program to catch the packet on the other end. Um, I think over time, um, we'll add support for running hybrid clusters and we'll, we'll basically add SNAT support to the, the BPF data plane so it can interwork with the other types of cluster, the other, the other types of node. Uh, SCTP is not supported. I think there's some limitations in the kernel for supporting SCTP in, in BPF. I believe that the um, BPF support for um, updating packet checksums hasn't been updated to SCTP, although I could be wrong there. Um, and that makes it uh, very difficult to, um, to do um, like cube proxy function and do the NAT for SCTP. Um, we don't support the log action. I mentioned that right at the start, but it's um, it's uh, the log action in our in our policy um, impl is implemented by an IP tables log action, um, and the IP tables log action isn't available from BPF because it's just a totally different point in the kernel. Um, so we need to do something else to get logs um, uh, if if we implement that feature or just accept that it's a difference between the two data planes that can't easily be resolved. Um, in version 3.18, which, um, which came out just a few weeks ago, uh, host endpoints are now supported. So before that, we released with um, workload endpoint support, support only, so that pods and not hosts. Um, so we've now added host endpoint support. That was, that was quite a big piece of work. Um, and host endpoints is the, is the feature that kind of intersects with um, cube proxy and, and being able to interwork with, with the uh, vanilla cube proxy versus needing to do our own. So if we had to do our own, we, we wanted to make it better. Um, but we, we sort of had to do our own because we planned for host endpoints down the line. Um, we're missing do not track policy, which is kind of another thing that's sort of specific to to um, IP tables, um, that policy disables contracting for a particular flow for some very particular use cases. Um, I think we are going to do it, but I think we, I think it will end up meaning something a bit different in um, uh, in BPF land. I think it will go towards uh, being implemented in XDP and um, like being a sort of uh, really early. Um, Pre-filter, like like we have in in IP tables mode, where we have a we have a little sprinkling of XDP to to do some of this function. But I think we can do a more thorough implementation of that um, on the on the base of the the new BPF data plane. Um, and for a long time, uh, it wasn't available in Calico Enterprise. Um, but I'll just do a little plug. We've um, we've introduced it in Calico Enterprise three point five. Um, so we've added a bunch of our enterprise features in there, like flow logs and um, uh, enhanced uh, types of policy, like tiered policy and so on. So that's a tech preview in, in Calico Enterprise 3.5. Um, that's all I have about BPF. Um, just have my couple of slides on um, the other data planes that, that Calico has. Um, so. I guess from, from the beginning of Calico, um, 
the, the data plane, I mean, certainly from quite early on, we made the data plane pluggable. Um, and a big driver for that was we started off in Python uh, with, uh, with Calico. We were, we were part of the open spec ecosystem in, in Python. And when we saw Kubernetes coming along, we thought that was the thing to, um, to, to really sort of engage with. Um, we just decided that now was the time to, to rewrite it into Go. So we split the product into, into two parts, like all the sort of brains and the data plane separate. Um, and we rewrote one in Go and then we rewrote the other. And we ended up with this quite nice um, split between the two. So you could run the, you could run the Golang backend with the Python uh, data plane, and then you could switch to the Go data plane. We could test them against each other, make sure they were really robust. So we ended up with this API. And that was really convenient um, when uh, Microsoft came along and contributed a, a Windows port of Calico. So the first the first data plane we added from from outside was the Windows data plane, um, and this was open sourced in in three sixteen. Um, now have in in the latest version we have BGP support and we're adding support for a bunch of platforms. So OpenShift, EKS, AKS, and Rancher are all on the supported list now. And AKS, um, it's it's kind of being baked in, so you can try it as a tech preview where it's sort of a, a tick box option, and you can just enable it on your Windows nodes in, in AKS. Um, I've got the docs links at the end um, repeated. So um, yeah, the Windows, Windows data plane is there, and we have an enterprise version of the Windows data plane as well that supports a bunch of our enterprise features. Um, and a new kid on the block is the VPP data plane. Um, so um, VPP is a, is a project from uh, Cisco, an open source project. Um, and it's part of the FIDO uh, project, which is why the, that's the, the logo on the, the right there. Um, and so the VPP team have contributed a data plane implementation for Calico based on the same, the same API that we have. Um, recently passed its first round of conformance tests. So uh, we're moving that to a, a Calico owned um, repo and they're, they're working on it in there as part of the, the official um, Calico release. And they're working towards a tech preview release where you'll be able to uh, enable this very easily. Um, it has some, some um, crazy features. So the, the, the name VPP, um, they're doing kind of heavily vectorized packet processing so they can process like 10 packets at once through a kind of vectorized uh, pipeline and using the, the vector operations in, um, in modern CPUs. Um, all very clever, runs in user space um, and they sort of uh, have various ways of getting packets up into it. And then it, it runs all the, um, all the protocols in user space uh, implements policy and everything, and then fires the packet onto your into your application. Um, I think uh, it's it's going to the next milestone for that is tech preview. So pass some conformance tests, but it's not sort of thoroughly uh, thoroughly baked yet. But it's it's really interesting and great to have uh, such a big contribution from from outside the team. Um, so yeah, interested to see how this one pans out and uh, how it how it competes with the BPF data plane. And uh, I'm sure we'll fight that out. Uh, that's the end of my talk. So um, I put some links up here for the, um, the eBPF docs, getting started with Windows and BPP. And they have a, a how-to for turning it on in your cluster now. Thanks very much. Mm, yeah, hi, thanks for the talk. It was great. I um, mean, it seems like we do have some questions um, if you want to take a look in the chat as well. But one seems to have been answered, but I think it's okay if we go again. Um, so I suppose it um, does eBPF give better performance than IPVS and does Calico eBPF skip contract? Uh, yes. So. Um... It gives better latency than IPVS. I'm not sure we've measured the throughput. Um, so, you know, performance is a multi-faceted thing. 
Um, but the latency versus IPVS is, is certainly better. That was the graph that I put up. Um, IPVS is pretty fast though, and, and our, our data plane is like, you know, a fraction of a millisecond faster in our tests in terms of latency. So the big win is against either of those versus IP tables. Um, does it skip Linux contract? Um, it does skip Linux contract uh, for workload flows. Um, but the um, the thing I sort of alluded to, I didn't I didn't really mention it, but um, in in version 318, um, when you go from IP tables to BPF mode, um, we kind of cooperate with Linux contract in order to make sure that it's not disruptive when, when you do the upgrade. So existing flows, we just kick out to Linux contract and let it handle them. Um, but new flows we handle in our own contract table. Um, just thinking about like why that might not have worked earlier. I flipped my cluster backwards and forwards from BPF mode today. And one guess is um, the flip from BPF mode to IP tables mode is disruptive because we can't do anything on the IP tables mode to make it less disruptive. Like IP tables isn't flexible enough to, to handle it going that way. So it's possible that I messed it up by flipping back and forth, but I, I'll have to dig into it. Cool. So we got. Um, yeah. Um, hope that answers it. And then we have another one. Um, what's the difference between IP tables and IPVS and eBPF? Okay, so IP tables is um, the uh, is Linux kernel's built-in firewall and load balancing solution. And the main thing to know about it is it's um, it's structured into chains of rules. So a rule might be something like, if the packet is going to this IP address and this port, then um, drop it, or then um, rewrite the packet and send it to this service instead. Um, and the structure of the rules is they're in a big long list. So you have a, a chain of rules. The first rule is processed. If it matches, it wins and it does its thing. Otherwise it goes to the next one. Otherwise it goes to the next one. And when Cube proxy programs um, the services into that, if you have 10,000 services, then you get 10,000 rules in a row. And if yours is right, if your service that you're accessing is right at the bottom, that's 10,000 rules you have to go to. And each rule costs about 0.5 microseconds. So they, when you've got 10,000, they add up to milliseconds. Um, uh, so that's IP tables, and that's how it implements, say, um, say uh, NAT for Cube Proxy. IPVS is a separate subsystem, uh, the IP virtual server subsystem, and it's basically a, a, a faster way of doing that. It has efficient ways of slurping up the traffic before IP tables gets, gets a look at it. And then it does a more efficient load balancing technique than having a thousand rules in a, in a row. It, it does a hash lookup to figure out what the right backend is and, and away it goes. Um, eBPF um, is this virtual machine that's very flexible. And one of the things that we've implemented is a load balancing solution that's very similar to what IPVS is doing there. So we take the incoming packet, we check it against a, uh, we do a hash lookup in a table, which is very fast to figure out, is this a node port? Is this a, a Kubernetes service? If it is, then we rewrite the packet and we send it. But that lookup is much faster than going down 10,000 rules, which is what you have to do in, in IP tables. So hopefully that answers it. Mm, okay, thanks. And then I guess we have another one. Um, and that is, can this be enabled with a CNI multiplexer? Um, so the configuration option for Calico um, is kind of global. So you turn on BPF mode and all of your, all of your um, Calico node instances will switch to, to BPF mode. Um, 
So you could multiplex between like Calico running BPF um, or like su suppose you use Multus to add two interfaces to every pod and one of them was the Calico interface that would run BPF mode. And then you could have a second interface doing some some other CNI, um, like say you had some DPDK special or something, you could you could do that. Um, and I don't think they would, I don't think the Calico side would have a problem with there being a second CNI on there. Um, you can't have two interfaces, one with BPF mode and one non-BPF, both networked by Calico, just because it's a global flag. Okay, thank you again um, for the great talk and for all the answers. Um, if there are no other, ah, I guess there is another another one. It just came. Um, so, what's the performance benchmarks when using IPVS and eBPF? Um, so yeah, I, I think I covered that already. Um, the um, the latency with eBPF is lower. That was one of the graphs that I put up. Um, so I think uh, IPVS was like 0.5 milliseconds. And if I remember from the graph, the BPF data plane was 0.4 milliseconds. Um, but I don't have uh, numbers on hand for service, like, like how much throughput you get on a service. Um, so yeah, don't, I don't have numbers for that. 